Okay, I'm going to go kick this off. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce my friend and very close colleague, uh, Dr. Gregor Neuert from Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Neuert obtained his PhD in physics in Hermann Gaub's lab at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany, where his research was in single molecule biophysics. His postdoctoral research involved experimental and theoretical biophysics on gene regulation in single cells as a Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, a DFG, postdoctoral fellow, which is a fellowship he received from Germany in order to study in the United States in Dr. Alexander Van Udenorden's lab at MIT. That's when Gregor and I met as we worked very closely together and an integrated single cell experiment and modeling study uh, that you've heard a little bit throughout the course and you're gonna hear a little bit more uh, during Dr. Neuert's presentation today. Gregor is now an assistant professor of molecular physiology and biophysics in the basic sciences in the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt University at Nashville, Tennessee. He holds secondary appointments in biomedical engineering and in pharmacology, uh, again, both at Vanderbilt. Dr. Neuert's laboratory applies multidisciplinary system biology approaches, like the kind that we've learned about here in the course, to address fundamental questions in signaling transduction and gene regulation of protein coding and non-long coding RNA in single cells. Since joining Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Neuert has been extremely successful in winning an NIH Director's New Innovator Award. He has also secured NIH R01 research grants, including one very, very recently, and is a Vanderbilt School of Medicine Basic Science Dean's Faculty Fellow. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Neuert, and we look very much forward to your talk, Director. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for the very kind um, introduction. And today I will talk about combining quantitative experiments with predictive modeling to understand cell biology. So as you probably know, in physics and engineering, modeling and experiments have been going hand in hand for a very long time. And one classical example is, for example, this complex radio, which can be simplified by this circuit of a capacitor, induction element, uh, and power supply, and a resistor. And if we actually know the different elements in the circuit, we can very easily predict based on simple equations that we all learn in physics undergrad courses, either what the voltage would be at this capacitor or what the current would be. And the reason we can do this is because many physical systems are deterministic systems. But if we actually look at biology and we look at individual cells, then we see that these cells can actually have very different responses, even so they are genetically identical. For example, here on top, you see a response of a gene, which is a DNA element that gets turned on up on specific external cue, and all of these bacteria, bacteria have exactly the same DNA, yet they express very different amount of a green or red fluorescent protein. Um, and these differences in expression can then also cause differences in what decisions a bacteria makes in terms of surviving this long elongated cells or going into uh, a dead state. And this variability has been then over the years observed not only in bacteria, but also in human cells. And this variability comes from variability at the RNA level as shown here in the bottom uh, pictures where RNA can be expressed at very different levels. And this is true for mRNA coding RNA that encodes proteins and non-coding RNAs, which do not encode proteins. And so this variability um, is attributed to the fact that a DNA can be accessible or cannot be accessible. And um, this is because there are proteins that bind to the DNA and make the DNA elements uh, accessible to um, machinery, which is called polymerases. And so if you now look at its many cells, um, then what we can, and we quantify these cells, we can actually describe this response of these cells in form of distributions. For example, here, a probability distribution of RNA molecules, 
And then this distribution can be described by different quantities. So we can either describe it as a mean, which would be comparable to the traditional average value um, that we often measure in biology, but we can also extract the variance. And if you want to get a kind of quantitative description of a noise, then a popular way to do this is using a Fano factor, which is the variance normalized to the mean. So this basically tells us how much variation is there in the system relative to the expression level. And because of this accessibility of the DNA, a simple way to describe gene transcription is to describe it in a kind of two state model in which there is an off state in which you have no transcription. And then there is an on state which is fully transcriptionally active. And then in this on state, um, the gene can be transcribed at the rate KR which then makes an RNA molecule and the RNA molecule can be degraded by the degradation rate. And if you now plot for such a simple model, the ratio of K on to uh, normalized to the degradation rate and the K off rate normalized to the degradation rate and we plot the Fano factor where a high noise or high Fano factor is dark red and low Fano factor is um, blue and the final factor of one means that it is a completely random process. And if you follow these dashed lines that are here um, labeled as an average of 25 molecules, we can basically see that along these lines, the mean expression is exactly the same, but the final factor changes dramatically. And if we now look at these three different squares and look at how does the distribution look like, we see that these cells can either have a bimodal distribution, they can have a long tail decaying distribution, or they can have a monomodal distribution. And each of these distribution give exactly the same mean, yet they represent very different responses of the cells um, in gene expression. And so what we thought about is that, is this variability just noise or does the different shape of these distributions actually tell us something about the underlying biology? And if this is true, then we can use these distributions as identifier or fingerprints to identify networks of gene regulation. And in the future, if we have a really good understanding of how to measure this variability and how to model this variability, we can maybe use this technology to then actually better understand what's going on between individuals or between healthy and um, disease individuals in terms of their gene expression program. And what I will show you throughout this talk and through the great collaboration that I have been with, with Brian is we are able now to actually infer rates of signaling. We can infer now different numbers of chromatin states as well as the transition rates. We are able to say what are the initiation rates. We can quantify elongation rate, export rate, nuclear and cytoplasmic degradation rate, all from a single experiment. And so why is this important? Because in biology, this gene regulatory process that I showed you as a simple two-state process is actually a highly complex process. For example, in eukaryotic cells, DNA wraps around histones and these histones can have different, very different marks. And even so we know we have identified all these different marks. Nobody can really tell you if you would mutate one or the other mark here, how a specific gene would respond. The same goes true for um, transcription process. The transcription process consists of many different proteins. Each of these blobs that you see here is a single protein. And we know a lot what these different proteins do and to which complex they belong to, but nobody can really predict how a mutation in any of these complex or a combination of complexes has an effect on gene regulation, nor do we know how mutations in between individuals or in upstream signaling transduction pathway actually contribute to diseases or how genotype contribute to phenotype. And so the, the overarching big goal is here to use integration of experiment with computational modeling to make predictions of combinatorial mutants. And ideally, maybe in the future, we can screen what are the most uh, 
significant mutants and what kind of effects do they have? But before we can do that, we actually have to ask the question, how do we objectively select predictive models of signal transduction that activate gene regulation? And this has been our uh, postdoctoral collaboration of Brian and um, myself. And we studied um, a very well-established, very, very well-conserved signal transduction pathway that activates gene regulation, which is called the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway, which is evolutionary conserved from yeast to humans. And in yeast, uh, in humans, this pathway regulates proliferation, differentiation, development, but it's also important um, for inflammation response, apoptosis um, or development or stress response. And in yeast, um, this pathway that we study is a high osmolality glycerol pathway. And this pathway responds to osmotic stress, heat stress, pH, or oxidative stress. And one, so what's great about this pathway is are uh, several reasons. First, if yeast cells experience osmotic shock and we image these cells on a microscope, we can see actually a volume change. So we can quantify cell shapes and phenotypes. If HOC1 gets activated through this series of proteins, HOC1 kinase gets doubly phosphorylated and then localizes to the nucleus. And this phosphorylation nuclear localization sequence goes hand in hand. And if you presently label the HOC1 kinase, you see this kind of red fluorescent uh, enrichment in the nucleus. And if you take movies of this, you see this nuclear localization in the nucleus and then um, adaptation and the disappearance. We can also look in the system at the RNA level or at the protein level. And therefore we can look at many different features um, across this pathway. And so what we have done is we have measured signal transduction of HOC1 for many hundred cells and then look for downstream gene expression using single molecule RNA fluorescent in situ hybridization, which is a methodology that labels individual RNA transcript. And each RNA spot that you hear, see here is a single RNA molecule and these bright spots in the nucleus are nascent transcripts. So this means these are genes that are actively transcribing at the moment. And we can then quantify here what's the number of nascent transcripts. And what we observed is that there is a lot of variability from cell to cell in terms of how much is the genes is turned on and then how much uh, when they are turned on. And so what we did is we quantified HOC1 signaling in populations of cells and they all responded homogeneously. We get this kind of signaling response. And then we measure RNA expression, which is shown here as this blue and black distribution as a function of time. And the question then is in what kind of model enables us to fit this data in one condition and then predict another condition. And through rigorous model selection process in which we write down models of different complexity where we fit the model to data which increasing model complexity causes a lower uh, fitting error but increased complexity also um, causes at some point an increase in prediction error shown here in green or an increase in cross validation error for the same kind of condition as a fit condition here shown in blue. And from this kind of rigorous model selection process, we were able to identify a four state model of gene regulation in which we are able to infer all the rates that are shown here, as well as we are able to show that the HOC1 kinase represses this backward reaction, backward reaction in a step-like manner. So we are very excited to have that model, but of course we are, want to understand biology. So the question now is how do you link a model to biology? And what we then did is we made mutant strains and we looked at um, overexpression of a transcription factor or deletion of two chromatin regulating proteins which are well um, established in the yeast field. And what we observe then is that for the same stress condition, they had very different signaling uh, gene, ex gene expression responses for these different mutants. Um, and you can see this by changes in the shape as well as the duration of these distributions of RNA molecules. And then what we did is we used the same model as before and we asked which rates do we need to change in order to fit all of these data sets and then actually make predictions. And what we found is that these initial transition rate from the state S1 to state S2 are highly regulated 
by this chromatin regulator GCN5 in a positive way or in a repressive way by this protein ARP8 and not so much other proteins, uh, other rates that are in this model. And so this allowed us now to connect a computational model to a biological model of gene regulation. So then after this study, we wanted to actually understand more, why is it that single cell data are actually more predictive than cell population experiments? And this was, again, a collaboration with Brian and um, very high, highly successful graduate student in his lab, as well as a postdoc um, in my lab. And um, Zach, I think, is now a postdoc, and um, Guliang has left the lab, and he's now at a different university. And so what we did is we looked at our data, and we asked the question, is there a difference? What kind of data and what kind of model assumptions do we make in order to infer parameters and then make predictions? And so what we do is we use the same data and the same model, and we either describe the data as a mean, a variance, on fraction, or distribution. And on the modeling side, we describe the mean as the first moment, the variance in the second moment, the on fraction, we use results from the finite state projection approach, and the distribution we describe for the a finite state projection approach of the chemical mass equation. And the main difference between these different approaches is that if one uses moment approaches, there are certain assumptions that go into um, when these moment approaches can be used. And this is called the central limit theorem that needs to be fulfilled in order to apply these moment approaches, whereas this finite state, finite state projection approach, we do not use, we do not have to make these assumptions. Um, also, in addition to the previous study, we um, expanded our data analysis platform to now quantify nuclear and cytoplasmic RNA, which enables us to now have a, um, a model in which we have a nuclear RNA levels and cytoplasmic RNA levels, which then give rise to nuclear degradation rate, cytoplasmic degradation array, and a nuclear export rate. And the reason we choose this kind of approach is first to learn more about the underlying biology, but also to ask the question, how does different complexity in the data help us in the inference process? And we use a maximum likelihood methodology to actually uh, fit the model to the data. And if you use a full um, distribution, we use a finite state projection approach, which is um, a computational way of dealing with the chem chemical mass equation. And here, um, the chemical mass equation gets truncated to the number of states that we are, uh, are interested to look at and the number of RNA molecules that we can measure in our, in our um, RNA expression experiments. And from that, we get probability distribution, which we can then fit to our data. And so in this study, what we did is we refined our image processing algorithm. So we are able to actually segment the nucleus in 3D and then this enables us to quantify nuclear RNA and cytoplasmic RNA. And we are also able to quantify number of nascent transcripts. And so what we did is we took the model, we fit this to either total RNA or the joint probability of nuclear and cytoplasmic RNA. We infer parameters, and then we use these parameters to predict nascent transcription within the same experiments in the same cells. And we do this for two different stress response genes called SDL1 and CDT1. And the way of how we quantify nascent transcription is that we integrate the total intensity of these transcription sites here, and we, div we divide that intensity by the average transcript intensity that we find in the cytoplasm that you see, uh, for example, here. And because we measure two genes, we can use one gene to infer the elongation rate, either in a simplified model or in a, a more complex model. Um, and then we assume that this elongation rate is constant um, for different genes. And with this approach, we are able to now actually um, infer all of these different rates that are shown in this diagram. And so what we then did is we took the model and we describe the data, which is shown here in gray, either as a mean, the standard deviation, the on fraction, 
or the probability distribution. And here on the right side, we plot the average number of um, nascent transcripts shown here in red. What we then do is um, we take a model and we uh, take so we take the data, we compute the mean, and we have a model that describes the mean, and we fit the mean model to the data for, at 0.2 and 0.4 molar NaCl, which is a red line, and we get very good fit to the data. But if we now take this model and make prediction for standard deviation on fraction, probability distribution, or nascent transcription, we are not able to actually make very good prediction. Particular nascent transcription is several, or this is a logarithmic scale here, so this is several orders higher than what we measure experimentally. So we then thought, well, maybe the problem is that um, we don't have enough data. So we looked at spatial data and we saw that spatial data helped to reduce um, the prediction for the nascent transcription, but not, not so much that we could actually explain all the difference. So then we used um, a model that describes the mean and the variance which is shown in blue, we fit the mean data and the uh, standard deviation data together to this model shown here in blue. We get very good fits, but when we make predictions again for the on fraction probability distribution and nascent transcription, the predictions are really bad and they even become worse. Um, and then we also did the same for the extended models. Um, and you can see in purple that these um, extended models also don't help significantly. Yet, if we use the FSP approach that enables us to fully describe the distribution, by definition, we should be able to describe the means, the standard deviation on the on fraction, which are not really true predictions, but we are now able to actually predict nascent transcription very close to what we measure experimentally. And we are also able, because we have this very um, robust image processing analysis pipeline to actually quantify nascent transcription at very detailed level, we can also predict fractions of cells with active transcription. And, we, and also, we are able to predict the full distribution of nascent transcription in single cells. And this is plotted here on a log scale. And we can predict this down to the detection limit, which is shown by the dashed lines throughout the full time course. So why are single cell experiments more predictive than um, cell population experiments? And this brings us to a concept from machine learning, which touches on this concept of bias and uncertainty in parameter esti estimation. So if you look at this target and each uh, black dot is a different parameter set, then a model that cannot be identified from the data um, is non-identifiable. Um, and then usually we don't consider that model. Often what we observe is that, or what we think that we observe is that we have a model that is uncertain. And this is maybe because we don't have enough data, um, but this model is not really biased. So meaning that all these parameter values scatter around the true values. But it could be also that we see that we have very tight parameter uncertainties and we think we have a good model but in reality, this model is biased and all of these parameters are shifted away from the true value. And what we aim for is a model that is unbiased with a lowest number of uncertainty. And so in order to test this idea, um, we did Monte Carlo simulations in which we can actually simulate how much uncertainty and bias is there in the parameter and the way of how to get at this point is to look at pairs of parameters. And here we looked at two biologically important rates, which are the initiation rate and the RNA degradation rate. And we compared non-spatial um, parameters from a model that is non-spatial to a model that is spatial. And what we observed first is that if we go from mean to variance to higher moments, we see that the distribution um, um, size shrinks. But when we go from a non-spatial to a spatial model, we see that the parameter distributions or ellipses actually shift to a completely different part in the parameter space. And this indicates that, we, that there is some bias introduced in this kind of approaches. So the question then is, why do we have such a strong bias um, using moment instead of distributions? And this brings me to the very 
fundamental assumptions that goes into using moments, and this is called the central limit theory. So the central limit theorem basically says the following. If we have a distribution of proteins, for example, and we want to estimate the mean, and we make five measurements of this distribution, then this distribution should be normal distributed. And if we make more measurements, then this distribution becomes narrow. So if the original distribution is normal distributed, five measurements are sufficient enough to, dis to make sure that the mean is normal distributed. But if we have a distribution that is not normal distributed, for example, a distribution that is homogeneously distributed by model or has long tails, then five measurements are maybe not sufficient enough to describe the mean um, accurately. And we have to do many more measurements in order to get a normal distribution of these mean measurements. So in our RNA fish experiments at this very late time points, our distributions are very asymmetric. They have very long tails. Um, and through these simulations, we wanted to actually estimate how many cells do we actually need to measure in order to estimate the means um, very accurately and the variance very accurately. And what we found is that if we use the Gaussian approximation, we need to measure around 3,000 cells before the distribution of the means become normally distributed. And if we look at the variance, even 3,000 cells is not sufficient. Because these are computations, we can then ask if we want to estimate the mean and the variance down to 1% accuracy, and we look at different time points in our experiments, and at these later time points, we need to measure around five, uh, five times 10 to the six cells or seven, uh, 10 to the seven cells in order to actually estimate these values very accurately. And this is far away from anything that we can do experimentally. And so this has really important implications because many biological processes such as signaling, distribution of cell types, or even the distribution of a population of individuals are highly asymmetric. And so if we want to describe these data sets with mechanistic models, we have to take into consideration that um, the, finite, the central limit theorem is fulfilled if we want to use moment approaches. And so what we are now doing is we're using these approaches to actually understand better what our proteins in gene regulation actually do. And we focus specifically on the Saga complex, which is a multi-protein complex in which we delete individual subunits in this complex and then ask which of these rates are actually changed um, in this process. And this allows us to actually now look at a completely new way of gene regulation. So now I want to switch to a different topic where we also integrate um, data with experiments, uh, experiments with modeling and here on the signaling side. And this is a study that was um, done primarily in my lab by um, Hossein in collaboration with um, Brian and, um, and um, yeah. And so what we look here is that we, um, Look at signaling, and signaling is a process by which different, environment, different changes in the environment can be processed, which then enables the cells to make decisions of if to lie, live or to die or prepare for a different outcome in the future. And what most people do is they use different concentrations of a stimulus to activate signaling. And this could be different hormones, stresses, signaling molecules, or drugs. Um, and then they measure gene uh, signaling response in these populations of cells. But if you actually look in a, in a human body, then these hormones are actually not secreted in this kind of abrupt changing um, fashion, but they can actually change in a kind of either periodic or time variant way. And this then causes very different signaling responses. And so we thought, is there actually a difference between what we see in um, in humans where signals can go up and down and what we actually measure in cell culture, which are these instantaneous changes. And if there are differences, then maybe this type of data that we get from these kind of experiments can be used to infer model in a way that is not possible with any other current approaches. 
And so in order to get started on this concept, we used a simplified model of signal transduction, which consists of four different nodes, which two input nodes that converge onto an intermediate node. And then we quantify an exit and um, an end node here, which could be seen as the Hawk one kindness that we have measured previously. And so what we do with this model is we um, e expose this model to different environmental changes of different shapes, so steps, square root, linear, or higher order polynomial. And then we simulate data for this kind of model. And the goal here is, can we actually computationally predict how do certain mutations in the model impact outcome? And how does this outcome depends on the type of perturbation that we choose? And so from that kind of approach, we could then say which of these rates are not insensitive um, to mutations and which rates are sensitive to mutations. And because these are simulations, we can now simulate a wide range of different stress condition as well as different types of perturbation. We can also have repetitive alternations such as a staircase, a pulsatile or increasing pulsatile or sigmoidal functions. And the idea is to use a subset of the data for training here shown in red and then make different predictions in blue, uh, yellow, green, or purple. And so what we did is we um, simulated data in gray and we fitted a model to that data and we fitted six data sets simultaneously to six a step activated signaling responses. We get very good fit shown here in red, but when we make predictions for new data, we see that the predictions do not work very well. We then used the same amount of data, but we use different part of parts of perturbations, which then again allows us to fit the data very well. And now we are actually able to predict the outcomes for, for new conditions much better compared to step conditions. And if we now actually ask, how is this model errors depend on the number of data sets? So we start with one step, two steps, three steps, four, five, six. And what we find is that if we add more step data, initially the errors go down in prediction, but then they basically plateau and we cannot really improve model predictions anymore. But if we use diverse data, we find that we can drive down the prediction error down to the um, fitting error. We are also able now to show that if we make prediction for the future, which is here six times longer than the initially measured period, for the step inferred parameters, we are not able to make very good prediction. But for the diverse kinetic inferred parameters, we make actually able to make very good prediction into the future. And then we um, tested this much more rigorously and we look, looked at models that are inferred from steps, roots, linears, any other type of um, polynomials or different types of repetitive function. And in all cases, we were able to fit very well shown here in red. But when we make a prediction shown in blue, yellow, and green, and purple, there is huge number of uncertainty. And only when we use the diverse data set, were we able to not only fit well, but also predict very well for any of these scenario. And so why is this the case? So what we found is that the prediction error, depending on what kind of um, training data we use, if we use a training data um, that is here has a specific polynomial function, and we look at prediction that deviate from this polynomial function, then we find that the prediction become worse. And only if we make prediction for the same type of data do we actually get good predictions. And, um, and what we actually then saw is that the prediction error as the number of train data increases initially goes down, but also the variation shrinks. But for the diverse data set, not only goes the prediction error down, but also the uncertainty in the prediction error shrinks as well. And the dash line is a measurement error that we have. Um, and we see that we can predict um, much lower than the uh, measurement error. And this kind of observation of better inference or lower in parameter uncertainty is independent of the methodology of the inference. So we either use Fisher information methodology or a Fisher information matrix um, to infer maximum likelihood or a Bayesian kind of approach. 
we also find that um, parameter uncertainty shrinks for um, the different types of data. And this can be shown here in these parameter uncertainty parable um, uh, ellipses for two different parameter values, where you see that when you go from the steps to the diverse in blue, that the uncertainty shrinks um, dramatically. We also, because we use the Fisher information methodology, um, we could now actually design an experiment and ask what is the optimal number of experiments that we need in order to constrain uh, model parameters. And what was really exciting is that for a number of three experiments, we are able to reduce param prediction error below the measurement error. And for the expert knowledge of how we uh, choose a diverse profile, we actually would need five experiments um, to actually reduce this uncertainty or prediction error um, significantly. And this is very important because in biology, it's sometimes very hard to actually do many different experiments or there are not many different samples available depending on where you apply this. Um, and so then we also applied this methodology to med model selection. So we used our true um, model here in the middle and then we either reduced parameters or we ad added parameters. Um, and we ask how is this model inference um, actually working for this different data set. So this, the gray data comes from our true model. We then fit the data, the model, and the simple model cannot fit all this data very well, versus the most complex model fits the data very well. If we now look at predictions, of course, if you don't get a good fit, we don't get good predictions. But if we have good predictions for the more complex model, we find that, the, that there is an increase in the uncertainty um, in the predictions. And this becomes very significant for predictions out in the future where the more complex model, the further we, we go away from the duration of training data, the further, the more uncertainty we have in the prediction. And um, so the reason for this is that even so in the step data, we get very good fitting error, prediction error initially go down, which is a good sign, but then actually don't really move up again, which eliminates discrimination between these models M3 to M5. But if we use diverse training data, we see that our fitting error in red goes down, it then plateaus off, which is expected, but then the prediction errors actually start to increase as the model complexity increases, indicating that now with a diverse data set, we are much better in discriminating between models. And so now we get to the heart of where we want to go in the future with this is, and, and this is, can we actually infer a model and then predict which part in the model do we need to mutate to see an effect? And what we found here is first, we just um, changed the parameters 15 and 16, this is, which is um, this feedback loop. And what we basically found is that if we mutate this feedback loop and then we use different type of perturbation profile, depending on the perturbation profile, we either get low sensitivity for a quadratic profile or we get very high sensitivity for a square root experiment. And so this means that depending on the mutant, there is maybe a specific environmental stimulus that makes this mutant most visible um, in the experiment. And under other condition, we maybe do not see a difference. And then there are rates which are non, do not change anything in the way of how we design the experiment. And this means that for these type of perturbations, maybe these are not sufficient enough to resolve that mutation. And so then what we did is we um, looked at all the different uh, rates that we have in here and we asked which of these are sensitive and which are these are non-sensitive under certain condition. And we identified these four reaction rates which are sensitive to the perturbation profile. And then what we wanted to do is we want to actually ask if we make a predictions for mutant compared to wild type and we quantify the difference in activation and we call this a severity, then we can ask under which condition do we have a most severe uh, response and under which condition do we have a least severe response. And so what we then did is we took our model um, and we deleted this feedback loop and then simulated data. And this is shown here in black and this is shown here in purple. 
So we then used the wild type model and fitted it to the wild type data and then make a prediction. This is basically everything we have been doing before. And this is shown here, we get very good predictions. But now what we do is we take this inferred model and we delete this backward feedback here. And then we predict what the, feed, what the response will be of this mutated model compared to the simulated data in purple. And what we find is that we make very good prediction for the simulated data set. And if you quantify this, we find that the prediction errors compared to the wild type model is equally good for any of these mutants that we observe here, indicating that we can truly predict mutants from this inferred model using wild type data. Um, and on the end, I like to thank um, the lab. So first of all, I like to thank Brian um, because without Brian, none of these slides that you have seen today were be possible to show because he has the mastermind behind all the uh, modeling approaches and has been also a great help in um, helping us to do the signaling modeling. Um, Zach has been very helpful in the second part when the second part of the first part um, in where we show where, how single cells are important for model inference. And then Hossein has done all the experiment as well as the majority of the modeling in collaboration with Brian and Zach um, for the second part of the talk for the signaling. And I also like to thank my funding sources and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, do we have some questions from the audience? And I'll get us started off one. I did receive a question in chat from a student. Uh, the question is um, more on a you know, kind of a general question. How do we know which probing kinetics to use or which combination of inputs to use in order to give us the optimal understanding of the underlying parameters and mechanisms of the system. Um, I think, so one way of how we approach this is based on intuition initially. And this was to basically think about what is the underlying biology and what is going on and how do we um, diversify the response dynamics that we could get. I think that's an important part. And we thought that this was a, the important thing. This The other approach, if you have a model, um, then I think the finite state, uh, the uh, Fisher information methodology is very powerful in actually um, computing many different possible outcomes for different kinetics and then use the one that gives us um, the pred best prediction for many different conditions. I think that's a way of how we have chosen this in the past and maybe Brian can elaborate on this um, a little bit more. Um, but I think initially, if you don't know anything about your system, I think you need to have some understanding about the underlying biology, I would say. And also the other thing is, what is actually experimentally feasible? I mean, you can, if basically the, mod, the FIM would say, well, do a 10 mi microsecond experiment. Okay, that's experimentally not feasible to do. Or do a hundred year long experiment. It's also not possible to do because then <laughs> you're all dead. Um, so those are things that you can basically exclude out. So initially you want to basically limit what is experimentally feasible and then start from there. Yeah, I could elaborate. I think this is something that we'd meant to cover more in the course, but we didn't get to. I, I can elaborate a little bit more on the Fisher information and how that's actually used in a practical manner. Uh, Greg, could you go back to the slide where you're showing like uh, error decreasing with the number of the experiments you did? And you had one that had intuitive design and one that, yeah, I think it's this one. <clears throat> and so, Let's just kind of look at the bottom uh, uh, curve. So the purple lines are using Fisher information to design your experiments. 
And we want things to be lower. We want the error bars to be smaller. We're hoping to get all everything below the dashed line if possible. That tells us that our model's about as good as it's going to get. Um, and what, what Dr. Neuer was showing is these two different experiment design strategies that one could take to doing enough experiments to get enough information to make your model really, really well. And in purple, the experiments were designed using this Fisher information approach. And just, uh, I'm wondering if I could, can I annotate? I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, you can. Um, I think, but I think you have the control over this or, or do I have? Um, oh, maybe you do, I don't know. No, let me. Um, I thought there was a way to do that because I did it before, but you can take control. Oh, there, I found it. I'm, I'm, I got it. Control over me. It's like a draw. Yeah. Okay. Let me erase that. So, what the, the, the neat thing about Fisher information is that what it allows us to do is kind of estimate what the variance is going to be after doing an experiment. And so, in this case, uh, you can imagine there are six possible experiments that one can do, six diverse experiments. Uh, they're diverse in that they're different. They're different types of experiments in each case. And um, of these six, each one's going to tell you something about the model, but it's going to tell you something a little different than the others. As you can imagine, in two-dimensional parameter space, you could have an experiment. Let's say we've got a... Uh, parameter one and parameter two. You get one experiment that's going to reveal quite a lot in the top left of, in this direction, but not very much in this direction. And I have a second experiment that basically does the same thing, but a little bit tighter. And it looks about the same, but maybe it gives you a little bit more information. And I have a third experiment that maybe does this. It doesn't tell you a whole much at all about that original direction. Oh, it doesn't really tell you a ton about the parameters, uh, but it tells you a lot about this direction. So if these were our three possible experiments that we could do in an experiment, and this is what the FIM analysis can tell us. It tells us how much we're going to learn, in this case, not very much, about parameter one and two from experiment one. So experiment one's not likely to be very informative. Experiment two is pretty informative, but mostly in this direction, it's informative. It's, it's thin in that direction. And experiment three is not very informative. That is to say the volume of this thing is bigger than the volume of that. It's not at all informative in this direction, but it's highly informative in the uh, bottom left to top right direction. So if we were to, so in this case, imagine we only had three experiments we wanted to do, one of uh, a combination of those three experiments. Uh, you, what you, if you're only going to do one, you're going to do experiment. So one experiment only, you're going to select experiment two. And if I'm only going to do a single experiment, I'm going to choose the one that gives me the most information that reduces uncertainty parameters as much as is at all possible. That's going to be experiment two. But if I were going to do two experiments, and, and actually what the result of this would look like, it would just look like number two. If I were to do two experiments, I'd want to do experiment two and three. And the result of doing both of those is first it's going to compress things in the top left to bottom right from experiment two, then it's going to compress things from the bottom left to top right in experiment three, and that's going to result in something very tiny uncertainty, much, much smaller uncertainty. Conversely, if you'd done experiment one and two together, you would have learned very, very little. If you'd done experiment one and three together, you would have learned quite a bit less as well. And so that's what the whole Fisher information idea is, is that you can test and that's what Hossein did in this case. He tested all possible combinations of experiments 
and asked which one is going to give the is going to result in the least amount of uncertainty. And that is one way of choosing which uh, input kinetics to give. And as Greta said, it, of course, it depends heavily on having a model or at least some nebulous idea of a model, one that you can sample over in order to do this kind of experiment design. Uh, but what was really quite interesting, what Greg is showing here and up here, you see that the, uh, the, uh, the model-based design of experiment did a really good job of reducing that certainty. Whereas the intuitive, the expert design of experiments, what you do based upon intuition uh, would have done quite, uh, uh, quite a bit worse. And I guess the other one is random. In no, what? I think one is one is step, one is diverse, and then is one is optimal. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we did random here in this kind of for this. Oh, I see. Okay. I think this will be interesting. Steps. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I found interesting is that, like the experiment 36 that we did last for the diverse comes out first in the optimal. So there is some some kind of experiment that. Based, I mean, I studied this pathway like since I started my postdoc. So since 2016, at a level of detail in quantification that nobody else has done. And I would not come up with experiment 36 to do first. So I think there is certain things that we do not maybe have the intuition for, particularly because we are not used to using these very diverse profiles. I mean, we are used to steps and if you look at the diverse data set, the first experiment that we choose is a step experiment at the high soil concentration because it covers a large range of signaling responses. Um, and, and so I think that um, this FIM approach, optimal experimental design exploit, I think is really powerful. And I think it's particularly powerful where it's very hard to get quantitative experiments uh, for mammalian cells, but maybe even if you would apply this to tissue samples, you want to compare maybe different individual, different mutants, different diseases where you have a limited number of measurements. I think for that in the future, I think there's great potential for that. The other thing is you can write a program to basically design all kinds of experiments and then run them through. Experimentally, that's not possible. I mean, it takes a lot of skills and time to do the experiments. Um, so if you can limit what you can measure, I mean, Hossein did an awesome job in generating this data in the first place. So, but I don't think that we can do much, much more than what we do here right now. Um, yeah. We'll clear all that. Any other questions? Uh we do have a question. Greg, would you like to ask your question out loud? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm wondering if um, all gene regulation needs to be predicted stochastically or if there are some genes whose output can be predicted like deterministically from like transcription factor inputs. Well, I think it depends maybe on what you want to predict. Um, so, I mean, I focus particularly on predicting um, like gene regulation dynamics. Um, and I think what we found is if we have um, a lot of variability in the expression levels, then you would need to measure probably a lot of cells and estimate the means very accurately in order to make like useful predictions. Um, but I think that if one takes single cell data and computes means from this invariances and then tries to infer models and you have a lot of dynamics in the variability, I would say it's very hard to make good predictions. Um, yeah, I think that's a, the, I think what's important is to, to make predictions in the first place. I think right now that's a really big problem in the field. I would say that people do not tend to 
go the extra step and make predictions. And I think you want to have a subset of the data that you use for fitting and inference, and then another subset for predicting and really rigorously testing this. I think that's a way to go, probably. And then you can decide if you need to go single cell or not. Does this answer the question? Yeah, it's a that's a really good question. I mean, there is got it, there are uses for ordinary differential equations and deterministic models. Absolutely. Um, but the problem is when you're looking at single cell expression, uh, it almost always looks highly variable. Right? If you lose, look at flow cytometry data, look at the single cell expression data. There's a lot of things that lead to variations. And one of the things I encourage everyone to keep in mind is that this whole idea of noise, stochasticity, this variation that we're looking at, um, it, for the most part, probably has a deterministic uh, reason. There's molecular collisions, diffusion, there's, oh, and it's just a very complex system that's underlying what we have observed experimentally. So there's so much going on under the hood that we're not including in our models. And that's where the noise comes from. The noise is probably for the most part not coming from quantum mechanic fluctuations. It's coming from molecular dynamics, molecular fluctuations. And as a result, but the, we, so when we're modeling using stochasticity of noise and either intrinsic noise or extrinsic noise, uh, the reason we do that from the modeling perspective is that it's convenient and it makes a problem that would have been entirely untractable, a chaotic deterministic dynamic system, which you can write equations for, but you can't solve these things. You can't fit parameters. You can't do any kind of the modeling that Gregor described here today without an assumption of stochasticity. That assumption of stochasticity made the problem easier to handle. It allows us to solve it. Without that assumption, if we went to the deterministic roots of the observed variability that we see, um, if we tried to get dig down to the details of molecular dynamics that led to that deterministic root of, root of what we're seeing is variation. Now, there's no computer in the world, and there never will be, that's capable of analyzing that level of molecular detail. It's unfortunate, I'd love to do so. Uh, but cells have been designed, uh, cells are at a scale where individual molecular events are important. And as long as that's true, we're going to observe variability. So as long as there's just a copy, a single copy or a handful of copies of genes that are important to us, that have important activation, you know, chances are we're going to see a high amount of variability. Now, the one place that I think that deterministic models can do very, very well is when all the time scales of important, right, the regulation time scales, when those are all really, really fast and involve large numbers of molecules. So even if there's a single gene, but there's a lot of transcription factors binding very, very quickly and unbinding very, very quickly, uh, transcription factors, that can happen at a fast time scale such that the regulation that you see, observe in the cell could look very, very deterministic. And then in that case, the mean deterministic models do very, very well. The kind of processes that, that Gregor is looking at that don't, don't behave that way. We're looking at slow chromatin configuration changes. These things are happening relatively slow or they're happening at kind of random times in response to when a signal crosses the threshold. In that case, we really do need the variability in order to come up with a model that's simple enough for us to analyze. The other thing I want to like to add is that if you have the model and we actually change individual rates, let's say a degradation rate or initiation rate or some of these chromatin switching rates or RNA export rate, different parts of the data actually changes. And in, I mean, in the simulation, so we see and we can really pinpoint if we change a specific rate, then a specific features in, the, in our data would change. And 
we actually think that these distributions are a cause of the underlying biology that goes on. And we want to use this information to really better understand gene regulation. Right now, a lot of people look at a specific protein has this one specific function. Let's say a chromatin regulating protein only regulates chromatin, but the experiments are done in such a way that you only look for chromatin regulation. You don't look at the same time at elongation, RNA export degradation. So in this modeling approach that we have, we can look at all of these processes simultaneously. And this allows us to completely newly look at, at biology. Um, any other questions? I do have a really quick question. Um, how much do we care about the um, down or not downstream? Because you know, like uh, genes develop. Uh, so there are so many different uh, types of cells that um, this can differentiate into. So how much do we care about this afterward process? Is does it? Uh, how do I uh, like phrase this question? Like. Um, what is the value of, you know, I'm sure, I mean, it's a lot of value. Like, how do you bridge this, uh, what we learn from a single cell? And then do we care about how that differentiates into different other types of cells or tissues afterwards? Like, uh, is this generalization applicable to um, a variety of groups of cells? Or, I don't yeah. know. No, I think that's a good, very good question. So, um, so we study yeast cells, and mm -hmm. the primarily reason we study yeast cells is that um, first we we can generate a lot of data, high quality data, which is a requirement for that inference process in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, second is that these gene regulatory. These gene regulatory processes or machines, polymerase, general transcription factors, mediator complex, saga complex, there's other regulatory complex. These are highly evolutionary conserved from yeast to humans. So you can basically delete the yeast gene, put in the human gene in the rescue function, okay? Mm -hmm. And these are also essential. So you delete any of these proteins in TF2D and the cell is dead. Mm -hmm. So there is like super essential for life. So, um, so this means that the basic understanding that I'm gaining right now in this yeast system of how do specific proteins affect gene transcription is most likely to be also applicable one-to-one -to, -one to mammalian cells. So mm -hmm. in mammalian cells, for example, if you look at the stem cell, stem cell can differentiate in many different cells. Um, and there are different transcription factors and different chromatin regulating complexes that act at specific times during this differentiation process. And um, if there are mutations in any of these proteins here, then this can have an effect on if the cell actually differentiate or not. Um, and it has been shown that some of these mutations called um, the embryonically lethal in mouse, they have been also shown, for example, mutations in TF2D, point mutations have been inferred to be important for mental retardation in humans. So there is a lot of neurological, there's diseases associated with that, but it's something that needs to be discovered um, yet. And so I think that everything we learn in the CIS system on either the experimental side or how do we design experiment or how do we do modeling can be one-to-one -one be applied to mammalian cells if we get data in these systems. And so we actually study long non coding RNAs in mouse embryonic stem cells and we get the same quality of data than we can get in the yeast system is just 10 to 30 times more labor extensive to get the same amount of data than in the yeast system, but it's doable. Um, yeah, so I think that is highly relevant to anything yeah. 
and in order to get involved in regulation. That makes sense. Um, and besides, the, what is the good reason, or maybe that's very obvious, what is the good reason that we are not like directly studying or modeling a mammalian cell or other, you know, um, uh, cells from other organisms that are yeah. more relevant to us? Yeah, very good. So, um, so I think one is, as I said before, you need to generate data that you can model. And the data needs to be reproducible, meaning that if I repeat the experiments three times, I want to get very similar distribution every time. Because if my uncertainty in my experiment is very big, then I have limits of what I can infer in the model. Um, then if I study human cells and I want to get this kind of data, then most likely people study cell lines. Um, and for cell lines, you can get this kind of data, but it just is. So for example, a yeast experiment, a time course of 15 time points takes two or three days to prep the samples, a day to image, and maybe another two or three days to run the modeling. So the modeling would run basically, I mean, the model doesn't care if you feed them yeast or mammalian cell data, okay? But in order to get the same amount of data, because the mammalian cells is bigger, I need to image 10 to 30 times longer to get the same amount of data. So instead of doing an experiment in one day, it would take a whole, full month to do that, okay? And as a graduate student, I mean, you want to graduate in five years and not in, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's in 150 sad. years, okay? Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's also practical reason of what you can do. And then because this, what we do right now is completely novel. Nobody has really done this before. It's not even clear how to do these experiments or well, when we started, when Brian and I started as postdocs, I mean, we had to develop the, well, I developed the fish methodology to do the time cost experiment. I developed the image processing software. And then Brian developed all the modeling approaches. And then we were able to infer a model in yeast. And this was a breakthrough. Um, and so now we know how to do that. And so I think there's just, you want to be on one side practical and feasible. Mm -hmm. What got the result? And in yeast, you can actually play around a lot of the experimental parameter to really figure out what's important. And then when we have that, then we can go into the mammalian system. For sure. Yeah, that's a really good reason. And um, just one more thing is, I'm sure this research will be very useful for people who want to develop like organ on a chip, right? Because you can maybe replicate some of the properties of the cell you want to model and try to develop something mm -hmm. outside of the organism. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah, again, I think we study like a single cellular organism. So we don't really, in all of this, we don't really take into account how the cells communicate with each other. So uh -huh. if you look at organ on a chip, that's where you really can or organoids where you can look into cell-cell communications and oh. you can control the environments. I think there's a lot to do, but I mean, just there are people that study Saga complex their whole life. Like mm -hmm. I had a colleague that studied TF2D and he studied this for 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And there are probably another five labs that do the same. <laughs> and they are all experts in the field and they have big labs. So I think it's just, it just takes time, um, but it's super exciting. And I think there's a lot to discover. Um, and I think, yeah, I think you guys take a really cool course right now to learn all of the basics. So it's super excited. exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really cool. Thank you. Are there other questions from students? Yes, uh, I, I have to, uh, maybe a uh, quick question uh, maybe related to you just question as well um so the first one is that um uh in a lot of uh cell lines or, or organisms the, the gene regulatory network is actually quite um unknown or ambiguous 
this approach seems to be also kind of a, a possible to infer not only the model selection, but actually infer the what the network is, is if we depend, uh, like do some simulation and then find out what's the, what kind of like parameter to per mutate so that it best can kind of like improve our network inference capability, right? Um, so I think that for this, uh, so the reason we could do this in the first place is because people previously before us have used a population-based study to identify which proteins in this gene regulatory complexes are have an impact on transcription of these genes that we looked at. So I would say that traditional bread and butter biology is still, if you don't know anything about the system and you want to know what are the factors that regulate the gene or a cell type, the traditional bread and butter biology approach is by far, I think the most effective and powerful way to get at this. Um, because I think that the experiments are very, if the experiments are done right, they're very well designed. They have a fairly simple essays and with a genome wide technology, you can get a lot of information about who, what are the involved players. Um, but if you have that data, then I think it would be good to look on a gene by gene basis at the single cell level to then take that information and build more accurate models, accurate models. Um, and, and then actually do a comparison maybe to see, do you really need single cell data or do you not? I mean, you can do with a single cell, you can take the single cell data for a pilot experiment to build a model with that. And then you do a model inference based on the population mean versus single cells. And maybe there is no difference because you don't have so much variation or um, your distributions are actually not so, so uh, long tail. And maybe then you say, well, it doesn't look so bad to do population average measurements. And then you go back and do RNA-seq or, or chip-seq or cut and run or any of these methodologies or a combination of them, okay? Um, I think what's important is that you get high quality data no, no matter what you do and that you understand what is the bias in your data that you get. That's also important. And this particularly I think is important for single cell sequencing methodologies. Um, yeah. Uh, to to kind of highlight that point, Greg, if you go to the figure that shows the HOT1, the GCN5, the ARP8, and the effect of the, on the parameters of those, it was just the kind of box heat. Yeah, that one. This has always been a really surprising figure for, for us in looking at it, and it kind of puts into context the importance of you can learn different things from different types of experiments and they can be, uh, they can seem to be contradictory or they can seem, uh, but I, I'd like to think of these as complementary ways of looking at a study. So doing biochemical assays, it's absolutely clear that a hot one is important to this pathway, right? It's a trans, hot one transcription factor is important here. Right, Gregor, from biochemical assays. Yeah, so if you not knock out HOT1, you do not get transcription of STL1. It's basically essential for a small set of genes in the stress response. So, so in other words, HOT1 is essential. It's a critical transcription factor for this pathway to work. And yet this analysis, if you look at the colors in the HOT1 row, they're all really dim. So there's a little bit in the K21, a tiny amount in the K4, mm -hmm. Uh, and if you actually looked at the data and you look kind of closely at the data between hot, uh, yeah, the wild type and the hot one, the first two lines, those look really similar to one another. There's some subtle variations you could start to pick out, but for the most part, not a whole lot changed, despite the fact that Gregor overexpressed hot one by a factor of five. So if you were trying to use this kind of technique, let's suppose we had no idea the importance of hot one. If we try to use this technique to infer, is HOT1 an important gene or not an important gene? 
by doing an overexpression analysis like, like Gregor has done here, it would have told us that it is not important. If he had knocked it out, it would have shut it down entirely. So in other words, third gene, so the context in which we do these experiments is, it is really important as to what network we're going to identify. And looking at all gene regulatory network identification studies that you know, we've seen in the literature for that context dependence of what you get is, that's always going to be true. And so we need to, we need to keep that in mind. So I wouldn't want to think of this as a, uh, a replacement for other gene network identification approaches. Rather, this is trying to get a much more fine quantitative understanding of known gene regulatory networks to really try to see under what conditions they behave in which ways and so on and so forth. So all of these different approaches, I think, need to be complementary. We need to look at these things at, from many different perspectives and many different conditions. And just be aware that when we present this, like we've, you know, Gregor presented, these are the experiments that he's done. These are the conditions that he's looked at, um, used as broad and as diverse a set of conditions as possible to get a model that's as accurate in as many conditions as possible. Uh, but it's still, all models are gonna have limitations. Yeah, I don't mean like uh, being a replacement because a lot of time in bio, uh, in, in signal uh, in gene regulatory network is like you have a couple gene or transcription factor that might have the influence, but you don't know how much of how big of a inf that uh, that that effect could be, and in a lot of time the, uh, it becomes impossible to design an experiment to rule out every one, single one of them. So combining those like a possible network that we know from uh, the assay or omic studies, and then with this, it could be a possible way to kind of like help the experimentalist to figure out what is the best experiment to design to best gain the knowledge in, in actually inference a, a more detailed network. Absolutely, and that's where this network topology comes from. Sorry, Gregor, please go. Ahead. Yeah, so I think that um, I think if you can basically prioritize where to what to look at, in in a like if you if they have many different proteins that would play a role, and it's not clear which of them has a priority. If you have a model that could predict, okay, look at model protein A, and then look at protein C, and then look at protein M for example, then this will be um, like very useful. Um, I mean, what biologists also like to do is to see if you make a mutation and do you see an effect, a phenotype? So this means in cell differentiation, does this have an effect on differentiation? Or does this change, you make a mutation and then does a mouse look different or does the cells look different or is a cell cycle? I think that's something where in biology phenotypes and also we do that in the lab is do we see an impact of that mutation on the overall biology? And then we use that to say, okay, this has really a significant impact. So now we're gonna focus on that the next couple of years to figure this out. Right. Oh. Another question following up to Yijia's question. Um, so it is true that um, mammalian cell, it uh, takes a lot, a lot of time to kind of like work with. So is it possible to like uh, uh, kind of like using CRISPR that kind of like added a gene of bacteria or uh, yeast to uh, to have the gene of the mammalian gene that we're interested in, the couple, the couple of ones, and then we can use this to do a, accelerate the the process of research. So I, maybe I want I want to clarify a little bit. So I'm not saying it's impossible or not one should not study mammalian cell in this context. So I would say that the computational methods that we have developed. Um, and as well as the experimental methods that we used here are fully capable of applying this to mammalian cells. 
And I think that's something that we are planning to do. All I'm trying to say is that no matter how, how hard you work and how much money you have, you always have some differences from yeast to mammalians that are just given by the physical nature of these type of cells. Um, on the other side, in mammalian cells, much less is known than in yeast cells. So if you make one mutant and you show a difference and you can do a model inference and then you can make a prediction for a different condition, that's probably a breakthrough. And it gives you, would potentially have lead to very nice papers in yeast. This just by alone maybe not be sufficient enough for the same type of publication. So you need to do more things. So in the end, I think there's always some trade-off. I think what's the only thing is one needs to think about how much is actually known in the specific cell types you study about the protein you're interested in. If there's nothing known, then, then it's very difficult to just start from scratch with single cell kind of experiments that we do here right now. Then maybe some other methodology is better to learn something about this. But, um, but then there's also other assays. So we use flow cytometry assays now for study signaling. And there we can generate a lot of data in time fit experiments. So we can look at 50 markers of protein phosphorylation over a time course of 12, mark of 12 time points in different environmental perturbations. Um, and we get very good data for that with very good reproducibility. But it's not imaging data, it's flow cytometry data. And in that data, I think you can do a lot of things. Um, if you make a CRISPR mutant in mammalian cells, I mean, we have not done that, but it takes much longer than doing a mutations in yeast. And, um, but again, the bar is also lower. So maybe one mutations would be sufficient enough um, to actually gain new insights and you definitely could potentially could gain that. So I think it all depends on the system you're studying and the questions you're asking, what you want to do. Right, thank you. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time. I wanna uh, thank you again, Gregor, for the very nice talk. And um, it, is it okay if students who have further questions can email you? Yeah, that's fine. I also just wanted to stress that we have a quantitative um, biology program at Vanderbilt where we are eager to recruit motivated students who have a quantitative background, physics, engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering. Um, and we are always looking for students who are motivated and excited. Um, and there are many different possibilities to work in different labs on campus. And Vanderbilt does seem like a really nice place to work on quantitative biology. So I'd encourage everyone to look into that. Um, and Gregor, of course, is a fantastic colleague to work with. So if you do, uh, talk to Gregor as well. Uh, thank you again for the very nice presentation. And uh, that's all for today, everyone. Uh, we'll meet um, tomorrow for the final tutorial, uh, which we're going to learn about fitting uh, some FSP style models, master equation models to single cell data, very similar to what uh, Gregor presented. And we'll do a collab notebook book on using Metropolis Hastings method to quantify uncertainties of model fits to such data. So with that, we'll wrap up for today. Uh, thank you again, Gregor. Everyone have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for the great questions. <laughs>